Ladies and gentlemen, there you are again. Thank you so much for joining us for this last panel of the day about addressable ads on pay TV platforms and targeted ad measurement metrics. That's a whole mouthful, but it's actually at the very heart of what is being built because in essence, the addressability of the internet is making its way to the TV world and that's happening across legacy systems, across different networks, the operators are moving in, the broadcaster are thinking about it, advertisers are catching up. In other words, we're building something that hopefully will be um, a way to keep making fantastic content and getting it to people. So um, we have a wonderful panel here with people really in the lead in different European countries. And let me introduce them very briefly first. So we have Ran Janais from SETIN, Vice President TV and Media. Ran, I'm going to ask you a very short question. What exactly do you do? <laughs> <laughs> just so, briefly, uh, just a few lines. Uh, really briefly. We are yes. in SETIN as a part of the PPF group, building end-to-end -end TV service, like from content acquisition till subtle boxes and smart TVs. And we are allowing operators to have fully managed service uh, at TV, OTT, end to end. So and you build, the, you, you build the whole thing, right? From the from, whole thing from yeah. monitoring, remote control, set of boxes to content acquisitions, back end, front end, and CDNs, the video delivery network, the head end, everything. Just write a small check and we will provide you. Uh, full, full managed TV service. This is like all right. And you're based world. in the Czech Republic. And is it correct that you launched four days ago? Or we launched like last week in Serbia, and we are about to launch soon in different other countries. Okay, well, we'll discuss that more in a minute. Uh, Alexa Radonic from Vida United Media. What exactly do you do? <laughs> sure. Uh, so. As what we understood recently, like we are going to be competitors with Iran, <laughs> but yes. all in all, like what is Vida is, Vida is an addressable advertising platform, uh, the first one in this region, in the Balkans. We are now live in Serbia and in Slovenia, soon to be live in Montenegro as well, uh, following Bosnia. And hopefully in the next year, we're also going to launch Bulgaria. So we are part of United Group, which is basically divided in United Media with a content wide and like advertising and everything. And with the telco business on the other side, which are the cable operators and telco operators. So uh, at the end of the day, Vida is actually established as the company between these, these all stakeholders and providing the addressability on our markets. And now we are uh, doing and providing those things on the digital platform for TV called Eon. And we're actually uh, doing dynamic ad insertions for live TV program. And, and you only work for your own company's networks, right? Yes, at yeah, this particular exactly. moment, yes. Yeah, we yeah. have the ideas to expand, but at this particular moment, all of the stakeholders are part of United Group. And, and, and is your core uh, asset that you develop your own tech or is it more about getting all the processes in order? Uh, so to be totally frank, we have the third party integrator, which is free will. So we use their ad technology, but apart from that, everything else was, is developed in house. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, Liberty Global, Abel Jan Tebbe from my home country. So I know a little bit more about where he's active, but Liberty Global, of course, is all over Europe. What exactly do you do? Uh, well, we used to be all over Europe, but uh, well, uh, Li Liberty, uh, famous for, for uh, being very active in mergers and acquisitions, uh, sold off uh, a few uh, what we call operating companies. Uh, these days, we are still active in, uh, in six different countries in, in Europe, and uh, I'm responsible for uh, what is called advanced advertising, uh, which basically means that uh, I'm uh, working on developing uh, addressable advertising uh, for our uh, operating companies. And since you have six different countries, six different legacy systems, six different ways of measuring, six different ways of knowing what the audience wants and doesn't want, right? I mean, this is not yet an internet type generalized service, right? It is different country per country. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although we're trying to, uh, to harmonize our uh, technology stack, uh, which means set of boxes. Uh, we basically develop mainly solutions for our Horizon 4 platform, which we are rolling out across, uh, across Europe. Uh, but we still uh, need to deal with some of the uh, legacy systems. Uh, um, ironically, uh, some of the countries where addressable advertising is already live, uh, 
uh, still have legacy systems on which the solution also works. For example, in the UK on TiVo, uh, which ha has been Horizon, uh, Horizon 4 nice. <laughs> uh, and uh, in Belgium, we're live on uh, the legacy platform called uh, Sipeden. And uh, we're about to launch on Horizon 4 in Belgium as well. It's amazing that as a company who actually owns, I mean, from the set of boxes to the networks and so forth, you still are confronted with this, you know, myriad of different set of boxes and things and networks. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. yeah and obviously yeah. this has a long history of uh, buying uh, companies uh, yeah. in the UK, in Belgium, yeah. uh, etc. You go for scale, but you end up with lots of little islands. Exactly, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. We wish we could scale everything uh, straightforward. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true for everybody here. Christian, um, Ad Scanner, what does Ad Scanner do? And you have a big background in this field as well, right? You've built more things than just Ad Scanner. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, it's gonna. Give us a bit of their background as well, because I think it's relevant okay. for the whole discussion. Okay, so not about asking about myself. Uh, yeah. I'm Christian. I'm now with Etskena since uh, June, but I uh, was uh, before that I was working for RTL most of my career. Twenty years, I built up uh, RTL now, and from there, Vox Now and all the other VOD platforms of the media group RTL in Germany up to uh, TV Now. Then I moved over to RTL Two, was their head of digital, and created a. Five years ago, a um, young audience platform called RTL2U, um, which was already doing addressable TV in the meaning of uh, dynamic ad insertion in uh, linear streams. It was really interesting, uh, but it was the first test. We were too early, to be honest, for the market. Yeah. And now I'm with uh, Ed Skinner. Ed Skinner, so, we... Ed Skinner, tell us about yes. Ed Skinner, because there's one solution to this problem of, you know, we hope so, standards, yes. right? Uh, so we see ourselves as a video data, data platform for cross-device measurement and activation. What does it mean? We work together closely with telcos and other data partners to collect usage data, because we always say usage data is gold and uh, the pipes of the telcos are full of it. Most of them haven't discovered this yet. That's good for us. And uh, uh, yeah, what, what were we doing? For example, in Germany, we were working together with Vodafone, collecting currently data of more than 800,000 uh, devices from net boxes, cable boxes, mobile devices, and uh, measuring the usage of especially linear TV, also time shift, VOD, etc. And this from from our point of view is for, for measurement it's a great picture you get uh, what in this case Germany is watching or in the Croatian market where we are also operating is watching uh, because you have big numbers and uh, device data is not only device data from our point of view it's big data smart data we can get a lot of it and uh, also it's a perfect foundation for other business models like ID matching addressable TV and so on so yeah yeah because the data, I mean, I think that goes for everybody here. Uh, where's the data? Who owns the data? What data is available? And what data are advertisers already interested in? Or could new advertisers be interested in? Um, I think it would be interesting to look at some of the case studies. Let's start with Alexa. Fida, you, you have started with, you know, segmenting data across your region. And what did you come up with? What did advertisers want and did not want? And what is the new thing? Because you did some surprising stuff there as well. Sure. <clears throat> so, oh, uh, mute. yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, first of all, what I wanted to mention is that when we talked about now and we mentioned the legacy devices, etc., uh, Vida is enabled only on all IP devices, meaning all internet protocols. So, we divide them in first screens and second screens, meaning all the native apps that you can install on your phones, tablets, or even watching on your browser. And on the other side, you have uh, smart TV apps and uh, advanced set of boxes, which is actually uh, fully integrated and are uh, sending the signal through the internet. Um, that allows us to actually mine all those data points uh, with the, in the first, like a first party, uh, third party data that we have. And we're actually generating all the behavioral data on all the devices that we are airing all the um, uh, VDAD blocks and every other stream that we have. So uh, what we started, and it was an interesting point that um, like, it's, a, it's always a dilemma, how you're going to penetrate first the market and what are going to be the attributes that you're going to first launch with. So for example, we had different strategies for Serbia and Slovenia. So for Serbia, we actually launched with many interest attributes. 
with some audiences being a bit lower than um, than we anticipated. And what that what happened there is that actually we oversaturated with possibilities, especially for something being that new as addressable advertising. So we understood quite quickly that we actually need to like uh, but you, had, you had too many different audience groups to approach and the advertisers just didn't yeah. understand it so yeah. yeah apart from the basic ones that we have like age gender uh, device type and also what we have is like the location base but only on the city level um, apart from that we also had interest groups so we had around 30 30 something interest group that was actually devised from like the online online world let's say but we ended up actually narrowing it out to eight. And these eight are the ones that are mostly used. And actually, we have the now the last advanced one that is actually a combination with a certain parts that we devised. And that is the one that we, we previously talked about, calling buy, uh, buying power. So Yeah, okay, so buying have... power. These are the rich right. people, right? These are the most affluent lots in your, your target group. So how do you find out about buying power because sure. so that is interesting yeah. Yeah. yeah sure so um so how we approach the whole uh, the whole issue with buying power so we understood that there's a lot of people and a lot of advertisers that wanted to advertise mostly being on a high end of the advertiser scale so what we what we've done is actually we took a couple of points that we had so for example which tier of a subscription do you have with our cable operator uh, combined with how often do you pay uh, your bills etc and combined with the types of uh, types of devices that you have per device and per household meaning that do you have the smartest tv or you have the latest iphone or you have the one before so when we interpolated all of that we actually um, interconnected with the data about being urban and in the urban cities and after all of that we actually divided all of our audience in premium members high mid and low income uh, households and actually devices and we're actually targeting based on a device so we're trying not to target households we're targeting only device and we're selling our inventory yeah. based on that so that's the one that is actually one of the most useful ones and one that we're selling a lot against so that one is like banks are like really trying to penetrate that one and so they yeah. are like really using that and, and I think that one is an interesting one because you can pull this information from your network because you can see when people pay and what devices they have. And it's not information that is logically matched as people used to think with, oh yeah, that's an expensive street and there's a big house. No, it can be a student with a lot of money. I mean, it can be completely different kinds sure. of people than you had before. Yeah. Exactly. And we're always matching that with different types of behaviors. So it was an interesting thing. So for example, one of the, one, one like one another example that we had was for example because we have also one of the interest groups is actually parents and we had parents based on some behavioral uh, behavioral issues that we had so you can match people who are uh, being perceived as parents but on the other side what helped us a lot actually was behavior during covid because there was a lot of uh, in the households you can watch on live tv networks where you can see all uh, where kids were actually watching school on the tv station so we can match that and we understanding that in certain households you had kids so like when we so we were like our data team is always looking into insights where we can actually map and what is the best best utilized part so the so covid the, the the pandemic helped you enrich your data set because you could track more behavior including the do kids yeah, especially because know. of the higher penetration yeah. during the lockdowns of course Albert Jan, I know you have different markets, but um, you also have uh, segments, right? I mean, in, mm -hmm. in the UK with Sky Media, you have over 100 segments, right? I mean, yes. how, how does this differ per market? And are there super interesting new segments that come out because we can now access so many different types of data? Yeah, I guess it, it, it really depends on how a market has started and uh, who is in the lead. So, for example, in the UK, we have a close partnership with uh, Sky Media, which is the, the sales house of, uh, of, of Sky. And uh, they, they not only represent their own channels, but also a bunch of third party channels. And uh, obviously, they, they started like seven years ago on the Sky platform. And uh, since 2019, I believe, uh, also on the Virgin Media platform, which is owned by, by Liberty Global. So um, uh, as is obvious, Sky already had the targeting capabilities on their own platform. So it made perfectly sense uh, to start using the same. So um, the, how it works in the UK is that uh, we work together with a company called Experian. Uh, is a data processor and data provider. Uh, they enrich the, the household ideas of Sky and uh, Liberty Global, so Virgin Media. 
uh, with all kinds of uh, targeting segments and uh, potentially uh, there is even there are even some uh, internal uh, segmentation criteria from Sky added to the mix and I think they provided to Experian and Experian enriches uh, not only the Sky platform but also our platform with those uh, attributes. And those can be used those for are, targeting those are purposes. household based, right? I mean, yes. my feeling is that anybody who is coming into this from the broadcasting field thinks of households, where right? if you come into this from the telecom operator field, you think of devices, individuals, and I mean, a lot richer data sets than just households, right? I mean, you think of a big screen with the family in front of it, it's harder to target. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think that the main the main TV consumption is still in the in the living room or on the big screen. Uh, that's why it makes sense to uh, use uh, household targeting. And yeah. obviously, for for many of those uh, viewing sessions, people use the set box, which is yeah. also a a household device and not a personal device. You know, things start becoming personal. Obviously, if people start to use their uh, their uh, iPads and their iPhones, for example, yeah. then then it can be really device based targeted. But uh, for now, it's just household targeted. And uh, obviously, and is, is that the same yeah. in all the, the regions? Because I know that you know in, in the Netherlands or Belgium or the UK, it's they even use different uh, segments, right? I mean, it's, yeah. these markets are different. They dif measure differently. They, the advertisers think about the segments differently as well. Uh, true, true, definitely. But uh, still, I think the main uh, segmentation possibilities are set the box based or so household based. Yeah. Uh, in Belgium, for example, uh, tele networks with two different uh, data providers, one uh, enriching the data with external data, but also with uh, Telenet data. So Telenet also uh, uh, started monetizing their own viewing behavior, for example. Uh, and uh, Telenet also allows for uh, the usage of so-called first party data. So data advertisers want to bring themselves or maybe yeah. advertisers want to work with uh, uh, the, the third party data provider of their choice. Yeah. So in yeah, Belgium, yeah. Uh, for example, Bpost and Carrefour, they are also selling their data, you know, their purchase intents, etc. Yeah. And through the data processing setup they have, you can actually ask for enriching of the household ideas with that kind of data. Okay, so so it's really flexible. There's, there's machines whirring in the background, combining all kinds of third-party data services as well at the moment, bringing, you know, making sure that you reach the right people. Uh, Ran, do you also have it set in these new kinds of segmentation that's now coming up because of the new tech that's coming into the market? Or is it, I mean, I know advertisers as people that tend to want to stick with what they know. <laughs> okay, no, Maybe not online, but uh, definitely for TV. No, I would like to address it from like a different angle. Uh, I will not speak about like a, a, a type of data, but I would like to just from the operator's perspective, also mm -hmm. to share like, what are the steps or what has to happen in order to make all this data usable? Because we are talking like everything is doable uh, and it's here and it is working. The answer is yes. From a technical perspective, as the team is sitting here and saying, it's there. Uh, a lot of companies are doing it. Google doing it. The problem usually for operators of start doing it is to understand how can they start getting money out of advertising? What is the business case? And for that, they need to start looking for the content rights. And the content rights in order to make the uh, advertising is usually hard to get for someone who does not own the content rights. And what I was exposed when I started to handle it in 2018, when I was in Israel working for a company called Cellcom, and we didn't have the content rights back then, is we tried to figure it out uh, how we will be able to do it. Definitely, if you're approaching the studios like Disney and the others, you're getting like a hard stop on a second, and they are not allowing you to have any kind of advertising. And then you are going to the broadcaster and it's really hard to get it from them. When time goes by, it's become, and it, it will become easy uh, uh, more easy. Right now, as I see it, uh, the right way to handle it is to start discussing with the broadcasters, getting their permission, and start with the catch-up rights. 
uh, because the catch-up price is a kind of money on the floor that they are not getting real money out of it. I'm talking about the broadcasters because the, the broadcasters right now saying, no, this is like when you're talking about live, this is like our money, our rights, don't touch it. And for operators, which I'm here like representing their state of mind and their needs and their will, uh, it makes sense to start with the catch-up content. When you are handling catch-up content, you have much more time to prepare yourself, to prepare the segments. Segment is pretty much on the same way that uh, uh, the, uh, the panel here was talking about, because like you are doing the segmentation once in a while, you are having all those segments that are kind of static slash updated once in a while upon your running uh, uh, some kind of analysis of uh, the segments. And by that, you start and you are able to do and to do the matching on the uh, okay. specific you, Let's revisit linear versus uh, catch-up content as a place for uh, addressable TV and advertising. But uh, what you're also saying is, okay, we need to, you know, first <laughs> convince the content owners, the broadcasters and the advertising market to this. Um, but eventually the whole system will be automated in a way that completely new kinds of parties can move in, right? I mean, right now, the who, who advertises on TV? Big consumer brands. But if you can, you know, target me in Duivendrecht and we took, I mean, it is a completely different kind of advertiser can come in. It's very local or very niche or very, and that whole market doesn't exist yet. And so I kept imagine that the segmentation eventually will be so much more detailed and interesting than it is now that you don't, say you know households poor rich one two three whatever exactly <laughs> this is what we see happening in, in the uk and uh, also in belgium uh, and maybe to a lesser extent is that uh, i think the majority of the addressable tv advertisers are new to tv advertisers so they didn't use the uh, to tv or uh, they didn't use to advertise uh, they were not used sorry to, to advertise on tv and and because of the uh, segmentation possibilities and things like Frequency capping, very important. Uh, it allows them to uh, to actually, uh, you know, uh, purchase a, a reasonable budget for their purpose, for their target group. Yeah. yeah. Christian, you look at this, I mean, you have this experience both from RTL as a commercial broadcaster and now from Adscanner trying to build the measurability and transparency in this market. Where do you see this going? What, what interesting new target groups combined with advertisers are turning up now that we can make this more visible? I think the, uh, yeah, what I don't get is I have to ask, uh, first of all, why should broadcasters give up their rights on catch up? Because it's uh, really important for them to have these rights because 25, 30% of the consumption is coming from that right now. So I don't think that especially the big broadcasters will give that up. I see what I see in the German market is especially linear, smaller linear stations who are already struggling to sell their inventory on a linear basis, are open up, uh, opening up for addressable TV. That's uh, what I see in the German market. Um, yeah. Also, Can I, I comment on that, uh, Christian. Yeah. Maybe good to, to emphasize that uh, from our perspective, uh, from Liberty Global perspective, we're not trying to change the ecosystem. We're basically yeah. enabling the addressable uh, uh, features, functionality, and, and targeting capabilities to allow the broadcasters to, you know, use this uh, new functionality to make more money than they can do without. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So I think what yeah. would be important is to have the right to measure this content, this catch-up content, not to have the content right at all. But for the telco, it would be important to have at least a, to be a control instance and maybe to be like a, they can also be a sales house for special kinds of uh, advertising and like swipe, uh, um, zap in advertising and, and so on. There's also opportunity for telcos. Uh, for the broadcasters, yeah, they can do their own thing. Like the biggest biggest ones in Germany, like ProSieben and RTL, they are only already going together together. Uh, uh, on a kind of silent way with, uh, with DeForce, um, which is a good approach uh, for them. Um, but still there's room of improve for improvement. I think the telcos have to be clear that they have, they, or, or the other way around, we are all talking about wallet gardens and th these big wallet gardens of the GAFAs are 
they have all the usage data, but there are already since 20 years, huge wallet gardens in the market with billions of revenue that are TV, the whole TV ecosystem, but we are not uh, using this. That's the yeah. biggest problem. Not, not yeah. used to collecting data. That's for yeah, sure. yeah, that's you know, problem. That's, they are yeah. selling, the, the, the telcos are only selling contracts. Uh, I, I remember once at RTL when I, I had the idea to collect the, uh, it was before the internet came up, I had the idea to collect all the postcards coming in and saying we should write down this data because then we know more about our customers. And the answer was... Postcards, they were sending postcards. Yeah, yeah, it's sure, lovely. like <laughs> asking for autograms or yeah. some, stuff like that. And I said, let's, let's collect all these because then we, we will be able to get a bigger, better picture of the viewership. And the answer was, no, we have already a huge, giant CRM system. That's our program. That's our CRM. We don't need that. Yeah, so you see yeah. that's changing dramatically. That's good. But, but, you know, we, we, the, the whole example of everything happening on the internet and IP is, of course, changing the whole yes. system that we are all working in right now. Um, so yes. what you all describe is, okay, we should make the, you know, the addressable TV market easier to access, transpar transparent so that we can... But if that happens, how will this eventually change the the medium itself because it will change it right i mean right now it's even, not even clear where things are i mean it sounds weird but are you can you can put ads as part of the user interface you can put it as part of a background then there's a smart tv i mean people are seriously confused on what is what on their tv <laughs> yeah true <laughs> There's all kinds of services and there's ads and who knows i mean yeah. alexa you you have this experience with fida do people uh, I mind? think Ron wanted to say something, so I'll. I'll oh, sorry, Ron, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah go okay. ahead. Uh, I just wanted to, to make sure that uh, uh, everyone understands. No one is saying that operators are about to take the uh, ads rights from the broadcasters. The only thing is that they might affect, because of the targeting, they might affect what will be, which kind of commercial will be broadcasted to the customer. Okay, this is number one. And this is like how operators can help the broadcasters. To deliver uh, a targeted TV. On the other end, everyone understands that uh, users or, cast or, or the viewers are starting more and more and more tending towards the catch-up. Catch-up is rising, is rising, and rising, and within the catch-up, uh, usually the broadcaster is losing the, uh, the effect of the commercials. If someone watching it in four, five, six days delay, or even three days delay. And what operators can do because of the catch-up services that they are providing, they can provide extra uh, opportunity or extra money for the broadcasters. By so they, they just created more inventory. But, but it, it, let's talk about catch-up and video on demand and everything that happens there by addressable advertising. Obviously, if you can fast forward the commercial you can still skip it. Um, and then all kinds of operators are trying to stop that functionality. And then the consumers hate them, of course, because this has happened. What, what do you feel? I mean, what is a good balance between um, the catch-up functionality, the video on demand functionality and addressable advertising? Or is the linear the more interesting way to no. go? Currently, and definitely linear is like uh, definitely in peak, in prime time, in sports events is not something that someone think is like, uh, uh, let's, let's call it uh, becoming less important. But I'm currently having on my table a request from part of the broadcaster to stop allowing the fast forward, okay? On the catch up, which because catch up become more and more and more uh, uh, interesting for the customer. And right now, broadcasters understand that this uh, cause harm for them. So I'm having options as an operator, either to stop it, either to pay more, yeah. or either to be able to allow them to replace the ads. So it's there, okay? The question is how operators are about to handle it or to, or, or to yeah. uh, get advantage. The big machine uh, get is getting more, more yeah. yeah, the big machine is getting more buttons, more, you know, there's more things you can adapt and change. And uh, Alexa, I think you wanted to add as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, I just wanted to, like, clarify a few things. So, for example, it depends on the market as well. So in some markets, like catch-up TV is really utilized by 
um, by the broadcasters like really well. On some other markets, depending on like the Nielsen measurements and stuff, the consolidated GRPs are extremely low. So um, what Ron said, like we're like evaluating, for example, in our perspective as well, because like we see that there is a possibility there. We still are not like pursuing that, but we still believe because like when we're talking about that, we are talking about trade-offs. So basically from one side, it's a consumer. On the other side, you have a broadcaster. So basically um, you had an, an, a great example in Belgium where actually all the broadcasters agreed that uh, when you're doing catch up, you are not allowed to basically fast forward. And that's actually like the whole market made an agreement. And that's yeah. one way of uh, pursuing that. On the other side, we believe that possibly there is a possible trade-off that could be beneficial for both parties. Because like when you're fast forwarding, you need time in order to fast forward uh, all the ad block. So basically, if the ad block is like six minutes, let's say, and you can give someone one or two unskippable ads, then probably that is a trade-off that like a consumer would be willing to to do. So like we're still like experimenting with that, but we we, we believe that definitely that will be some kind of a some kind of a trajectory. Well, we want to go as well, and we think that actually the whole markets are going to depending on the market at the end of the day because you have some markets where actually the like people are not far fast forwarding that much. So it really depends. Like that's like some of the countries that we talked about, which is mostly in Far East. But on the other day, like on the other day, it's like it really depends on a cable operator, on a broadcaster, and their mutual agreement with, of course, yeah. bringing the big, getting the biggest value for the consumer. Yeah, yeah, and and we should also remind that it's not like we already know what it all will look like. Everybody is still experimenting with this and finding out what works, and it's not the same per market. I mean, Alex, about experimenting, just very quickly, because you mentioned uh, earlier that you also have some clients that actually now do A-B testing on TV, right? Which is also new. It's, it's not happening with all the advertisers, but it's possible now, right? Sure. Yeah, that's totally true. And like you can do A-B testing basically like you're doing it on digital. So either A-B testing with different creatives, which is something that is most common with us. So for example, we now, the recent campaign that we had was actually really A-B testing the creatives targeting different audiences. So basically, is it like uh, younger men, older men, younger women, older women? And, it, uh, and also parents. And then actually we had a client um, who is actually uh, having now a campaign that is actually targeting different audiences with different target groups and different creatives. And like in, in total, they're trying to like perceive what is, what is better for them. On the other side, we had a couple of campaigns as well, which had the same creative, but it was actually targeting different interest groups. And they're trying to see the view rates in both of them. One of the things that actually is definitely constrained on all of our work is that we're talking about brand awareness and we're talking about mostly not uh, not performance campaigns. So like we cannot measure clicks yet, et cetera. That's definitely going to change in, in the future. But for this particular moment, yeah, mostly yeah, view brand. rates are something that was quite, quite interesting. So we provide that to our clients, for example, with viewability rates, meaning uh, is the ad watched 25%, 50%, 75%, <laughs> And 100, obviously on TVs, mostly view rates are higher than on digital, especially because people are familiar with the environment where you are watching the ads. Uh, but we do see some ads and we had an interesting campaign that actually had a huge dropout after 25%. Then actually uh, they wrapped it up. They definitely, it wasn't only uh, with us, it was on digital channels as well, but actually they got an incentive that the first, first quarter of their ad, they had some issue in it, meaning that actually the, the, the main thing was it was like a bit too chaotic. It was like too advanced to the consumer. It was like a bit, you know, with a stand back. And it was an interesting concept. That was the only one that happened ever that someone actually optimized, actually paused the campaign. And that's also- so there's, There's A-B testing, but very rarely they change something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, no, but, but, but I, I think, I sure. mean, I, I just mentioned that the advertising uh, industry might be uh, set in its ways on one hand on the other hand there's so many super creative people there that if you give them the chance they will find new audiences and new types of ads and and everything right sure. i mean okay. Ab abidjan liberty global is such a such a big company uh, over different markets as well and uh, quite developed markets what what is the most interesting use you have seen by advertisers of addressable tv i mean what what what, what is really the thing you say like, well, that's a campaign, that's the use that is really made for. This is this is perfect. This you couldn't do this before. Yeah, tough question. That's, that's a very good question, uh, and and also a difficult question to answer because we're, we're uh, as a as a platform, we are not really involved in the in the campaigns themselves. So occasionally, I know, I know, we see some campaigns passing yeah. by. 
But I think that you know the the combination of uh, regional targeting and uh, and also uh, looking for specific um, you know specific target segmentation options like uh, people owning a house, maybe uh, maybe a pet, for example, uh, having a certain income, uh, maybe also owning a car or maybe a specific type of car. That sort of uh, usage of of segmentation yeah. is is quite advanced, at least for. For TV, obviously, yeah. for for online advertising, it's uh, you know uh, business as usual, I would say. So in that sense, it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, TV is, is is actually trying to catch up. But those are the things that weren't possible, obviously. Yeah, and Christian, I mean, if 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 this market needs to move forward, uh, what is there something that is holding it back? Is there something that needs to change? I mean, obviously measurement tools and transparency make sense but that's probably not the only thing right i mean where do things in this market need to change you're on mute actually sorry i was coughing yes, no so, problem. uh no yeah currently see still a, like all said the very complex landscape uh, regarding of technology uh so the it's totally normal i think boundaries are disappearing between countries like on oh no, like liberty is operating so many countries they are all uh, like other operators uh, trying to uh, set one standard for their whole ecosystem, it makes sense that that will help a lot. Um, I think there needs to be an agreement on uh, between telcos maybe on standards um, to put in advertising on an addressable way. I agree also uh, with Alexa that uh, it will change linear TV because uh, we don't. I don't think that on linear TV there will be in 20 years, uh, still eight minutes or 10 minutes length uh, ad aisles. Um, maybe we see a content which is uh, way off and interrupted, or maybe we, we don't discuss this between broadcasters and telcos. Uh, we discuss it with the users and give him the option <laughs> to say what he wants, pay or short interruptions or longer interruptions like he wants. Um, so I think uh, it's like in every market, if you see uh, the, the mobile market uh, years ago, I, I remember I was working for Hutchison Telecom. It was really new in the market. There were, I think, 20, no, no, 12 operators for mobile, mobile service providers in the German market, and then it consolidated. It, the same will happen, I think, in the, um, in, the, in the content market also, because you see so many offerings rising right now, but they will not all live um, forever yeah. because they will get uh, uh, fusion and, and consolidate. And the telcos are in a pretty good situation, by the way, because they have all the data. You, you, you could data. argue, though, that because of addressable advertising, addressable yes. TV, you could we could avoid the new world where we have four or five big content operators and, and those are the only ones <laughs> that function. Because of addressable TV, maybe some niches could flourish and keep existing yes. well then it obviously will get bought up by the big content owners. <laughs> yeah no <laughs> yeah hey, that's, where are we going that, are we that's going a to little business? problem yeah. in that money yeah. rules the world so <laughs> i know i know i mean I'm, I'm, but it's I'm a nice idea yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> Okay, well, we if, have. If I, yeah. may, if I may jump in, I just wanted yeah, sure. to, uh, yeah, to give kudos to Albert and actually his partners from Sky. So I wanted to mention one great example that we are trying to pursue but haven't still had a chance for. And that's like when we talked about A B testing. So uh, Sky, the guys from Sky, because we we're connected through Free Wheel and then we had some workshops together at Tesla, were telling me that actually when they did the A B testing, they did it with like addressable in order to get the direction towards their linear campaigns as well. And that is actually an amazing insight. So like they had clients that had actually a couple of creatives, they actually yeah. chosen the ones which had the best view rates and then the whole linear TV, which is like mostly way bigger budgets, they influenced that. So like, yeah. like that's something that definitely is one of the things that like definitely is like coming from Albert and like partners in Sky and stuff. So that's something what we're trying as well. And we think yeah. that going to be even better like so you will yeah that, so the, the addressable tv surrounding as a playground and then you roll it out across sure. the whole network yeah okay sure that makes sense all right we only have seven minutes left no questions from the audience so far hey dear gentlemen now's the time if you still have a question <laughs> um I, I, the thing i always ask at the end is um where do we go from here but also maybe because all of you are building this what is the new tech or the new effort coming up that we think is really exciting because it's a very much a, a landscape in flux right i mean it's it's built of 
data companies and enrichment companies, and there's some machine learning and AI, and there is computer vision, and it, it's a big landscape of what is the part that you think like there's something new here and that's going to be exciting or that's that that's what I want to work on. Who wants to go first? Uh, if I may, like uh, sorry, sorry, Chris, uh, sorry, Albert, you go first <laughs> and I go yeah, go. You all get your say, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> you no, go. Sure. No, no, I wanted just to say, like, when we visited, like, before COVID started, it was the future of TV advertising in London, the, the event. And I think the, like, the, the case study that we heard there was, like, a really interesting concept. And that was actually happening in Australia. So what they've done, they consolidated all cable TV operators together with all the biggest uh, broadcasters. They created their own DSP and both DMP, now talking totally in yeah. digital. And actually, they, in the whole market, build up, the, like the, for the brand awareness point, the concept that is actually really was fighting with Facebook and Google. Because like yeah. when we talk about this, the biggest competitors are the biggest digital players, for sure. Like we're yeah. talking and we're like competing with a competitor, the Tesla, but at the end of the day, we need to consolidate all together if you're going to. So I think that's definitely one yeah. way and yeah so and, and, and that's that's something that's true across europe in different markets different kinds of corporations are now uh, building up or failing sometimes but uh, yeah it's absolutely a big thing uh who wanted to go next yeah i wanted to, to yeah, go ahead on, uh, alexa it, it sounds a bit like uh, the the project v of of itv uh we're also trying to uh, create uh, one well it's more or less a closed ecosystem with uh I would call it more like an SSP because they're they're trying to sell their inventory, obviously. But uh, looking towards the future, I'm expecting uh, a move to uh, to IP streaming, uh, not only uh, for traditional uh, OTT apps, but uh, also for linear channels. Everything will be moving to uh, to IP, and uh, probably sooner. And that's something we're currently already working on in in some markets. Is uh, that we are integrating our ecosystem as a platform uh, obviously first of all with the broadcaster but also allowing it to uh, use so-called third-party ad decisioning so basically we're creating a so-called programmatic setup where we are allowing to uh, you know to forward the ad requests to third-party systems mm -hmm. and uh, basically align with the existing uh, programmatic ecosystem yeah yeah. Makes it's it, a, makes it it's a bigger ecosystem and you make it more open so that more people can tap into it as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it and becomes part of a, an existing yeah. business because yeah. the, the still the big challenge, especially with uh, with linear ad replacements on the traditional uh, linear channels, is that uh, the, the, the sales is, is being done by the traditional TV sales team uh, who are usually uh, selling to big agencies. Yeah. And not to the, the smaller players in the market, so the smaller advertisers. So you tap into an automated uh, process where anybody can put in ads. And, exactly, yeah, yeah. from, from any, any budget, any reasonable yeah. budget, starting usually with uh, three or 5,000 euros, you can already have a campaign on, on TV. Yeah. Okay. Ron, what, what, what are you looking forward to? Um, actually, since we are just like fully IP, and I'm talking about like all customers and uh, our set of boxes are Android TV. The way that I see it is that the TV is about to become just another uh, playground uh, on top of the web or the mobiles and the rest. And as I see it, like operators are just looking for a simplification of having like one end-to-end -end solution. There are like already some kind of solution. One of them is definitely by Google and also by other companies. And when I'm looking on operators, they're just interested in simplicity and getting their cut out of it. So yeah. if uh, Google is doing it really good on web and mobiles in the near future, due to the Android TV, which is Google, I think it will be mm -hmm. really easy for operators to have a full ecosystem and uh, the agencies, everything will be managed by one solution and by that the, simpli the simplification will come and uh, it will be more and more um, used by operators. I'm talking about yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, targeted TVs. 
So basically our internet world is Google and Google will be part of all the TV world as well. Oh, I, it's scary in a way. Christian, for you to wrap this up. Yeah, I have a more, uh, hopefully a positive end. Uh, I hope, really hope the TV, uh, video consumption is about relaxing. That's what people are looking for when they watch uh, videos. So I really hope that we, when we are talking about data, we often talk about negative impacts of algorithms. So I, I really hope we use data in future to help to serve the people the best experience to relax. So like kind of using data as emotional data for relaxing in front of a screen, whatever this screen is. Okay, well, positive end there. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much and uh, keep building. We're looking forward to what you make out of this world. So thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Monique, for this very interesting panel discussion, which actually marks the end of the first edition of the next TV at CNDA. On behalf of that exit, we would like to thank you all, our sponsors, moderators, speakers, and you, the attendees, for your contribution into making this virtual event a success. I would also like to encourage you to visit our website, datexist.com, to take a look at our upcoming virtual conferences, as well as our in-person conferences for the year 2022. Till then, stay safe and see you all next year. Goodbye, everyone.